All right. Um, so hello and welcome to the uh, writing workshop this week. This is week five. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Twine. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, uh, Twine is a really cool open source uh, program that lets you uh, write text-based stories and games. Um, so uh, if you just look up Twine online, I mean, you'll probably get some string. But you'll also get this website, which is uh, the Twine website. Um, just uh, download the appropriate version, or you can use it online in browser if you want, and uh, you're good to go. So uh, today I do want to talk about um, some more advanced things you can do with Twine. However, uh, I would like to briefly go over some of the basics as well. So this is what Twine's interface looks like. There is a uh, day mode and a night mode. Uh, I prefer the night mode. Um, and when you create a new story, it looks like this. So if we look at this, um, it's pretty uh, standard view. Um, it's a workspace. These are called passages. Uh, these act as our story blocks, so to speak. Um, so really quickly, um, we can name this whatever we want. Uh, we can name it start, for example. And then uh, this we can just add text. So let's start writing a story. Once upon a time, there were a few people uh, in the game lab. Uh, so that's our passage, right? It's not very interesting. Um, if we hit play, it'll open up a web page with a tutorial. Uh, it didn't do the thing. Why didn't it let me do the thing? This is supposed to open a thing, not that thing. I'm not sure why that's happening. There we go, OK. So uh, Twine is cool because it opens up in web pages. If you save the file, it will uh, save it as an HTML file. Uh, if you open it, it'll open a web page and display the text. Um, so what's cool about Twine is um, you can apparently make one passage completely disappear. What the heck? That seems weird. Um, OK. So it seems like there's some things going on here. Uh, this is technical difficulties with this thing. I'm going to quickly leave and burn that with fire. Uh, try number two. <laughs> OK. So we got uh, once upon a time, one upon a time, once upon a time. Uh, the program worked. So uh, what happens with Twine is uh, through a series of um, formats, you can, um, that's different, keyboard. Uh, you can connect passages uh, like this. So between two square brackets, we can say next. And this will, if you look here, open a new passage, next. Um, so what happens next? Well, um, we learned how to use Twine. And if we play that and it doesn't crash on us, there's a fun little link here. So just like a web page connecting two different pages, we have a story. So that is the quickest bare bones what Twine does. Um, and there are all sorts of other things that you can do with it. Um, so uh, there are these things called macros, um, which uh, essentially they're like commands, if you will. So for example, um, this one sets a variable, right? That's the wrong tab. So if we wanted to deal with variables, so if you think of like math, uh, find x, right? x is our variable. It represents a number. In Twine, it works very much the same way, except we can store numbers, uh, strings, so that's like words and whatnot, into a variable. So if I were to set a variable, I would give it a name variable. Uh, this by itself does nothing. Um, by default, it will be set to zero. So if I were to play this, we would have a weird floating zero in our page. But if we were to use a macro uh, uh, to x, uh, that's not going to work. So what this does is it sets the variable variable to, in this case, a string, which is characters or letters or words, x. 
Um, twine is unlike a lot of coding things because you'll notice I had to type this two. That's weird. It, most code isn't like that. So uh, there's some weird formatting things there. Um, uh, so this is the second Twine workshop that I've done, and if you're interested in some of the basics, I have um, this document here, which is accessible in our Discord uh, through uh, Workshop Archive, uh, which does uh, cover some of the um, basic things about Twine, what it is, what you can do with it, uh, some of the most important macros that are good to know. Um, uh, it can handle things like logic, so if statements, so if the sky is blue, then the character says the sky is blue. Or we can make it say something else. Uh, there's a lot of really cool, really small things that you can do with this type of thing. Um, it can handle numbers and letters and all sorts of good stuff. Um, and yeah, uh, one thing to note is that uh, you may have seen it earlier, but Twine it has several different story formats. So we are currently working in Harlow 3.0.2. I am most used to Harlow 2.1.0. Uh, apparently the changes between these two versions are not too big, so everything should work fine as we're doing it. Uh, some other options include Snowman and Sugarcube. I believe that I want to say it was Snowman is closer to JavaScript, and Sugarcube is based on the original Twine code that they have since updated. Uh, if you have some coding background, um, I think that it's Snowman is slightly more workable. Uh, you can do some things in uh, Snowman that you can't do in Harlow, for example, with a little bit of coding. And I lack that coding, so I'm going to be working in Harlow. So, um, let's see. Uh, and each of the different story formats have their own um, syntax, uh, the way that you do things. Uh, I think that Harlow's the only one that uses all these parentheses. Everything else uses angle brackets, um, I think. Uh, but, you know, uh, if you can use one, uh, you're, you're pretty good. So, um, yeah. If you need any other help or tips, uh, there are a slew of resources to go to. Um, this site right here uh, has some like suggested methods of how to do some stuff, like uh, adding functionality. And, or adding functionality, not, not like adding like math, but like adding stuff to the thing. Uh, so for example, it says like uh, delayed text or dice rolling. It has some good ideas to start you off. Um, this Harlow manual is the default documentation, I believe, if it links, if it loads. Uh, this is the, this page right here. Uh, this has documentation for all the three different versions of Harlow, so that's good. Um, this link right here goes to a previous Twine workshop held by uh, an older writing officer. So if you want to take a look, I believe it takes a uh, it makes a really quick, really simple RPG, which is really cool. And uh, I also made a sample Twine game uh, over here. Um, so I'm going to run this really quick. Uh, this is uh, a one sample Twine game. So uh, I wanted to demonstrate a few uh, cool things that you could do in Twine with this project. So uh, there's a character, and they say, hello there. I might interest you in my wares. I have 50 gold. And uh, well, what do you have? He has two items that might interest me. Uh, this one's a book called a con What's a conditional statement? Uh, that is two question marks. Grammar, that's not how it works, I don't think. Um, so you know, some text. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure about that though. So I can keep on checking. You notice this page changes each time that we click it. Uh, and yeah, so there's some cool stuff that you can do in Twine. Uh, there's some text formatting and uh, all sorts of good stuff. So now I have 30 gold variables that so we can handle quick math, uh, numbers. Uh, this link has appeared that wasn't there before. That's something that we can do as well. Uh, I could also go back. Oh, now he's only got one item. Uh, set of dice. I have the gold. Sure. So now if I go here, uh, flavor text, different colored text. Uh, here's some fun stuff. Uh, these are links that uh, change a variable. This is a field that refreshes. So um, we can change this in the page. And that's a really cool thing. 
And I've made a little number guessing game. Which is relatively simple to uh, solve. Um, and wonderful animated text. That's always fun. Uh, dice. Uh, it can handle randomness and probability as well. So if you wanted to try to get a 7, uh, I got a 9. And roll again. And again. And again. And we're not getting anything. Uh, because I have terrible luck. Um, I have really bad luck. I am not getting any money. Anyway, uh, here's skill check. I am st yes, I got a nat 20. Okay. So um, these values change every time that we uh, reload the page. And yeah. So this is all stuff that I went over, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, my first swine workshop. Uh, this, um, this page is also available. Uh, you can download uh, this and take a look at it in Twine. Uh, and uh, I've commented the code, so uh, hopefully it'll be uh, pretty easy to pick up. So if I quickly, uh, so the way that you can get this in um, your own uh, Twine is you take this and you put it right here in this folder. If we go to Twine, uh, we just quickly go import from file, choose the file, here it is. So this is what that looks like. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, it looks a little intimidating. I just like the way that arrows looked. Uh, so I have a uh, commented code here uh, explaining all the different macros that I've used here. Um, so I highly suggest you take a look at that. Um, this one is in, uh, that's a different thing. This one is in 2.1.0, but uh, most of the things are the same. Uh, and yeah, so let's get on to today's workshop. So just like last time, I prepared a fun little uh, twine game to go over with you guys. Today I want to talk about uh, changing the color of the text, which we, you saw a little bit of in my first twine game, as well as the fonts of your twine game. Um, I'll talk about arrays and data maps, which uh, dip into programming a little bit, but don't, don't worry, we'll get over it. And uh, pop-ups, which are really <laughs> fun. So uh, I'm going to run this twine game. This twine game is a tutorial of sorts, covering a few topics. The code is heavily, heavily commented, so most of the explanations are there. I'll try to show some of the concepts in action in this game, uh, but I do recommend taking a look at both. Uh, I apologize in advance for the messy formatting, this is a lot of text to look at. So, where do you guys want to start? Colors. Colors, okay, cool. So, colors and stuff. Let's face it, the default colors in Twine are nice. Black and white, easy to read. But, it's really cool having the ability to change it too. And there are any number of reasons that you'd want to change it, like there's a fire, or maybe an object of indeterminate color that we want to showcase. Uh, this can be done in Passage uh, with a macro. Uh, to take changes at large though, you'll need to go into the story style sheet in the Twine editor. Uh, these types of changes will affect the entire project unless you uh, similarly change the text specifically. Uh, actually, I realized that I've done this in a silly order. We should take a look at this in Twine too. So I'm going to quickly uh, grab that, open it up at Twine side. Where is it? Uh, I think this is the one? Yeah, that's the one. So if I go here, import from file, just grab th th that one. Um, this is the code for this one. It's much simpler than last time's. Uh, let's look at colors. Um, so this is what it looks like in the code side. Uh, we have a macro text color, sets it up to a, a CSS color code. Uh, this will modify this hook, which is a hook is the text within two square brackets. Um, any changes that you make can apply to the entire hook. So if I were to say uh, fire and lava, that will apply to both fire and, and, and lava. Um, so the one that changes color uses this live macro, which essentially refreshes everything that's inside the hook that follows it uh, every set number of seconds, in this case 0.6 seconds. I did not want to set this too low because then that would potentially be seizure inducing. 
Uh, and then this sets a color to... Okay, this is complicated, hard to explain it, and I'll let you guys read the comments for that. Uh, it involves an array of colors um, and cycling through that. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll let you guys look into that on your own time, but that's the thing. I'll come back to that if we have time at the end. Also, if, I, if you have any questions at any time here, uh, feel free to stop me and ask. Uh, and yeah. So, if you look at the comments, uh, text color, it's a macro, changes the color. Um, you can use a CSS color code or uh, a color like red. It'll understand that, though you might not like the shade of red. So, I do suggest using a CSS color code. Um, rotated, this is the macro I'm going to skip over for now. Uh, this is all explanation for what's going on with the rotated thing. Uh, there's this macro text style, which is, acts just like text color. You put it in front of a hook, and all the uh, effects from that uh, macro will apply to that entire hook. So if you recall from uh, sample twine conversations, there was the fun, uh, oops, there was the fun shaky text. Uh, if we go here, so this shaky text uses text style, the macro. Um, Let's see, a line uh, is similar, uh, it works just the same as text color. Uh, the weird thing is you have to use these arrows. This is an alternative to using a line. It will uh, align all the following text in that manner. This is a center aligner. Uh, if you look at uh, start, uh, I use a line like this, right? You can do left align like this, right align, center align, justified, and you can be very specific and set the margins uh, based on the uh, relative number of equal signs, which is weird. Uh, on the subject of the CSS color picker, if you just go to Google and uh, type in uh, CSS color picker, that's not how you spell it, picker. Google actually has one built in, so this is really handy. Um, you can choose all sorts of colors that you like this way, and uh, just uh, Copy it here, and go into Twine, and paste it in here. You will need these quotation marks to make it work. So if we go in here, and it works, fire and lava are green. And this is an error because I set a value in a different page. Ignore that for now. So yeah, uh, any questions on color? Great, OK. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, what do you guys want to look at next? You guys like, do uh, you want to go into the technical stuff or do you want to go into the fun stuff? fun stuff? The fun stuff? Okay, so let's talk about pop ups. They're really fun. So, really quick, pop ups, as the name implies, makes a dialog bo box pop up when you click something or when you call the, the, the macro. This can get very annoying. Um, if you are full screened in a twine, uh, twine game in itch, it will pull you out of the full screen and pop up that pop up. So uh, for that express purpose, you can't full screen this twine game. Um, so uh, the way it, what I've done here is well, I'll let it explain itself. Makes a pop up appear. Uh, you get to choose what it says, um, and yeah. Uh, there's some other stuff you can do with this, though. There are uh, three different variations on this, uh, this macro. Uh, we can also do this. Uh, so then you can OK or cancel, right? Oh, not giving a hug to myself. A versus, great. So uh, depending on what you uh, choose in this dialog box, uh, you can work on with that in Twine. And here's one that is incredibly cool that I really wish I knew about sooner. You can have the player input a, a text into your Twine game. Uh, what was your favorite part about today? The time with my friends. Um, I can type anything here. Um, eating breakfast. And then I can save that and use it again later. Uh, so I'm going to jump into the twine side now. And just a heads up, this is going to be really ugly looking. Uh, so uh, here's what it looks like in twine. Uh, there's probably better ways to do this. This is just the way I've done it. So here's the plain and simple text. And here's the first one, uh, alert. So alert very simply uh, makes 
the following text appear in the in the uh, in the dialog box. Uh, you'll notice that I have it inside of a hook uh, with this link repeat. Um, link repeat is really handy, as the name implies. Uh, link repeat uh, makes the text that is in quotes within the parentheses uh, a link. So you saw click me. That's the link, right? And anything that's inside of this uh, hook right here is uh, what happens when you push that link. A really fun thing happens if uh, it's not just macros. If we have text here, um, things get messy very fast. I do not suggest this, but there are reasons. Yeah, so um, it's most useful to have macros and stuff in here, which don't uh, occupy space, which is a lie because they do occupy space. Uh, because um, if you look here, um, these curly braces are my way of working around that uh, aforementioned space that macros take up. Uh, this was a rough segue. Um, every time they hit enter uh, to create a new line, uh, even if it's a macro that wouldn't actually appear on screen, there will be white space there. These curly braces make it so that everything within those curly braces uh, occupies a single line. Um, so that's just a handy formatting trick. Uh, it can be tricky to work with, so just be careful. So here is uh, confirm, which acts just like uh, alert, however it pulls up the OK or cancel uh, options. So similarly, I have a link repeat setting it up, right? I have the text that will appear when we hit this link. And then uh, we have something interesting. So when you click, uh, when you click the, will you give me uh, the, I have a question, the link, it will uh, pull up the dialog box. As long as that dialog box is open, Twine is essentially paused. So it won't try to run anything until you finish that dialog box. Um, once you've hit OK or cancel, it'll pull you back to the Twine game, right? And uh, if you have any experience with coding, um, if you hit OK, it'll return a, a Boolean true. And if you say cancel, it'll return false. Uh, so um, basically, in conjunction with this if statement, it'll check if the thing is true or if the thing is false. Uh, we can work with that. So uh, this is a macro. If the, the um, confirm reads true, I'll, repl I'll replace a hook with great. So this is a what's called a hidden hook. If I wanted this to appear in the text, I would use an angle bracket, just like that. Um, it's empty, but using this replace macro, I can turn it into text that I want. This is one way I work around uh, messy formatting, which can happen. So if I were to not replace the, um, this uh, hook, and rather just have it return the text great, it would be very much like uh, this one up here, where it just appends, or, or puts at the very end, this text, boop, 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 uh, formatting uh, notwithstanding. Doing it this way lets me choose exactly where my text shows up when I want it to show up. Uh, so that's why I do it this way. Um, and then uh, this else statement, I don't need to have if else the question is false because there's only two cases it could be. So um, if the conditional above it is not true or doesn't take place, else will happen. And I can have any uh, number of um, other conditionals between them through a weirdly formatted if dash else uh, or else if excuse me uh, question one is zero. Uh, this will do nothing because there's nothing in this hook here. But yeah. So then, uh, just as confirm returns a value of true or false. Uh, this one uh, prompt that this is the one that pulls up the text box, right? This will return a string or a collection of characters or a sentence. So, um, and it, uh, the best way to handle this is to save it into a variable, bo variable both for confirm and uh, prompt. This lets you use it later very easily, as you can see here. Uh, so prompt is weird because it takes a couple of uh, strings. So we have prompt within the parentheses, uh, the question that appears, right? Uh, and then it takes one more string, which I have uh, 
more co I've complicated by having this either function. Uh, either will return randomly one of the following items. In this case, it is three different options that could occupy that box by default. So um, this text appears in the text box uh, when the text box appears. Uh, the player is able to choose this or to change this at will. Um, but I like to use it just to sort of set the expectation of what type of response to give. Uh, maybe they aren't sure what they're supposed to say or whatnot, right? So then now that that's saved into this variable here, <coughs> we can uh, uh, use that variable later. Um, so just a quick thing though, um, if the player is a wise guy and uh, hits cancel or otherwise leaves the, the spot blank, uh, it will still continue, but it will give the string blank, as in there's nothing in that string, which I find to be a somewhat boring outcome. So I like to check to make sure that they didn't do that. So this is unless, it works just like if, but sort of backwards. Um, so uh, basically everything except if it's blank, it'll just say, hey, this is your response. Otherwise, um, if it is blank because they didn't input anything, uh, it'll say, you didn't give me an answer. So this is just an additional check. It's not necessary. Uh, you could just have it uh, just take the variable and run with it. Um, and yeah. Uh, also, really quick, I would not suggest putting alerts on a live macro. <coughs> this is bad and sadistic and not cool. And I can't. It's, this is, don't do this, probably, unless you want to, because it will evoke a, a guaranteed reaction of some sort. I also can't close this unless um, it's between the pop-up appearing. So uh, yeah, don't do that. Would not recommend. Uh, gonna put that back in a comment really quick. This is how you comment in uh, Twine. It's weird, it takes some space and it looks ugly. But it works. Uh, so if you want to read more, there is much more to read about this uh, in the code. Um, any questions about pop-ups, uh, prompt, confirm, alert? No? Okay, so we're going to get into the, the, the tricky part here, which isn't super tricky, but uh, I don't know. It's like, if, it should be fine. <coughs> and if it's not fine, we'll make it fine, because that's what this workshop is for. So arrays and data maps. Uh, how many of you guys know what arrays are? Have you worked with programming at all? Great, so everyone knows what an array is. So this should be pretty simple then. Uh, data maps are, I'll get into those in a bit. Uh, they probably have a definition in programming that is similar to the exact same or very different from how it is in Twine. I'm gonna be operating off of what I understand it to be from Twine. And uh, what's, what's the word, disclaimer? I'm not a programmer. So this should be fun. So for a variety of reasons, uh, we might want to list a bunch of things in Twine. Uh, this would be done through an array. Uh, array is like a list. Apples, <coughs> oranges, bananas, tomatoes. It's a list of fruits, right? So we might name that array fruits. Uh, you could do that by uh, this code right here. Uh, so an array is set with this uh, a colon and then all the items in the array. Uh, by itself, not too useful. I suggest setting it to a variable so you can use it again later. Um, if I just type fruits, make this variable show up in Twine, this happens. It doesn't even give us spaces between the commas. Uh, obviously, we could uh, add a space bar, but that would get wonky with the formatting and whatnot. Uh, if I wanted a, a specific entry in the array, um, I would have to do something like using this uh, print uh, command, which may have changed in Harlow 3.01. Uh, uh, so double check that. but. Uh, I would print this value from the array. This is friends, uh, friends. fruits two or second item, uh, which will return oranges. Twine's real like that. You have to use an apostrophe s here. Uh, this can make naming variables really annoying. Um, I mess myself up all the time with this. I'll say uh, fruits instead of fruitses, uh, and it'll be like, why isn't this variable working? I set this variable. So uh, bear that in mind, but it also means that um, you can do some really cool stuff, which we'll go over in data maps uh, coming up. And yeah. 
So data maps are like arrays, except um, they store a thing under another thing, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so if you see a data map here, uh, data map x, y, a, b, essentially what it does is it gives the value y the name x. So your x is y, your a is b, or that you say that x has a value of y and uh, a has a value of b. Uh, which is hard to explain in words. Uh, let's talk about fruit. So uh, with arrays, we could list fruit. Uh, these are apples, oranges, bananas, and tomatoes, right? With the data map, uh, we could do something like uh, keep track of how much of each fruit we have. Uh, so if we had a uh, fruit stock as our uh, variable for our data map, uh, we could say we have 12 apples, two oranges, one bananas, and 500 tomatoes. Um, which means that if we wanted to print one of these values, we would say print uh, fruit stocks or fruit stocks, excuse me, fruit stocks tomatoes. Uh, that'll give us 500. This value here. Uh, quick note: to my knowledge, you can't get the value tomatoes from this data map. Uh, it's messy. So, like for example, if I were to say, give me fruit stocks 500, that would work because we don't have a 500th value. Uh, here we have four values um, and yeah uh, so a fun application uh, for data maps would be to keep track of character stats potentially uh, let's say we have a character named Wilbur uh, using data maps we could say that Wilbur has a strength of two a speed of one a luck of 20 an opinion that is wrong and uh, just for formatting issues uh, uh, formatting point 12, which makes no sense, uh, but that carries the value of favorite number, which is a string. So it works both ways. So for example, if we were trying to calculate a hit, for example, um, we could say maybe like, uh, take Wilbur's strength and multiply it by 500. That's the damage we deal. Cool. Um, uh, and all these values can be changed with a set macro. If we wanted to change Wilbur's opinion, we could simply set Wilbur's opinion to right, which would switch out the string that is connected with opinion. Um, and yeah, uh, that's all for this in this side. If I pull it up here, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, so uh, I have the, ver the array here. Really quick, I actually set up this array over here. This is where I set up a lot of stuff. Uh, this is a separate passage. Uh, this is just to keep it looking clean. Uh, or so this passage runs by proxy uh, on this page by uh, this macro. Uh, the display macro essentially runs a different passage inside of another passage. So uh, this page will run all needs to run, and then it'll run uh, a variable initi uh, initialization as well, which is this passage. Really handy, good for uh, keeping things modular uh, if you want them to look nice. It's not necessary, though. It functions the same way as if we had all the stuff in this passage. Uh, so that's why I can do this here. Um, yeah, this looks about the same. Uh, explanations, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you could, if you're trying to get a value, you could use uh, arrays1 or arrays first. There are some cool things like uh, if it contains an item, uh, it can, uh, you can do Boolean uh, outputs from that. Uh, and uh, you can also get the, the arrays length. Uh, here. Uh, and yeah, it's really cool stuff. So then data maps, uh, self-explanatory, I believe. Uh, I like to format it this way just for readability. Uh, curly braces help. Uh, otherwise, I'd have a bit of white space, which is weird. Um, and yeah, uh, if you wanted to get like these values that I said you couldn't get, I have a workaround that I've used, which is like involving putting arrays and data maps and data maps and arrays. Would not recommend because it gets really messy because uh, you'll be doing like, uh, say, characters, Wilbur's strength modifier, for example, right? So uh, that's all in one conditional if you're doing like a check, right? So it gets really hard to read. Uh, so that's tough. Um, but yeah. And then over here. Um, yeah, so if we were to do uh, print Wilbur's 12, it would give us the string favorite number back. So you can use uh, numbers 
for strings and strings for numbers, it doesn't really matter. Whatever you want or need for whatever you're working on, and you're good to go. So I believe that is all that I have through this gameplay. Um, do you have any questions about arrays or data maps before we uh, move on a bit? All right, cool. So in that case, I'm gonna uh, try to pull up. Uh, I'm gonna pull up a toying game or two that I've made before. Uh, and try to see where I've used these things, because they're really handy. Uh, how do I get to me? Uh, how do I get to me? Uh, so if I go to my Twine Games. Uh, let's see. I think that this one's a good example. So um, I made this with the uh, Game Jam recently, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the theme was lose to win. I tried to go with uh, lose your negativity to win. So um, we have this text appear, um, and then uh, these links. And if I do this, I can say I'd like to speak my mind, and a pop-up shows up, and you can talk to them. Uh, and so I've saved a string with this key smash. Uh, that should be familiar, because uh, now hopefully you guys know how to do that. Um, and so this goes on for a while. Um, and then uh, if you go to the end, I pull out all the values uh, of all the things that you said, and uh, bring them back out. Um, so that's one way to use it. Um, and yeah. I was going to make a point about this, I believe. Uh, I can't pull it up because I don't have a way to download it uh, to this machine, but this, I believe, used some really inefficient uh, arrays in conjunction with data maps in order to access uh, the uh, which one it was uh, and what it is that they are, which wasn't necessary, I don't think, but I did it anyway. And then I used another data map uh, for the values of the things that you say that to them, so that I could use them later here. Uh, so arrays and data maps really a good way to store and manage your data uh, that you want to use later. Really quick, uh, can you guys think of any other uh, good uses or examples of why we would want to use uh, a data map? So for example, I had uh, character stats. Uh, what's another reason you could see yourself using it for a Twine game, you think? An inventory, yeah. So uh, just like we had fruit stock, if you had stuff, you could have like character gold. It could keep track of uh, all the stuff your character has. So, and um, theoretically, it's possible to add to a uh, a, um, a data map, uh, which would be a bit complicated, I think. But uh, essentially, I believe what you could do is. I'm going to just do pseudocode, I think, here. So let's see. So a data map would be like a data map uh, is a data map of values, right? So uh, one one's value, right? So that's our data map, right? Theoretically, what you could do is you could have a variable like a data map position, right? Uh, and if you set that to like one, two, uh, thing, say it's three, right? Um, we could do like uh, a button, that's a high school button, that uh, sets uh, data maps, uh, data map position two, uh, and then this could be uh, two, right? And then um, you'd want to set uh, data map pos to it plus one, right? Then you could set uh, data map, uh, data, wait, yeah, you should data maps, data map position, to choose value, and you can continue this um, 
because uh, this uh, sets it to itself plus one, it'll keep on going, right? The only weird thing will be that you are technically, because uh, the first one is the name of the value. The second position is that thing's value, or how many of that item there is, right? So you'd have to be conscious of that. Uh, but so for example, if uh, you kept on collecting stuff, um, you could be like, um, set that to uh, the item that you just got, like uh, a rock. We picked up a rock. How many rocks do we pick up? Uh, we picked up uh, uh, to we picked up like uh, five rocks, right? I could even uh, actually since this is a number, we don't even need to put in a string. We could just say it, it's five rocks, right? Uh, we could also say to uh, it plus five, I think. Double or you'll have to double check on that one. I don't know off the top of my head because we're getting some weird stuff on like uh, what is it. I want to say that's data map, state of position to it plus five. I think that would work. Um, so we could just add five rocks to our inventory if we already had rocks. Uh, which is a whole nother mess in itself uh, if we already have rocks. So if data map contains rocks, we'd have to do something else. We'd have to then uh, find out where that is. Um, I guess you could just do like set data map uh, rocks to it plus five. And there you go. So you could make theoretically a full inventory system uh, with a bit of programming, which is confusing, and a data map that you can attach more strings and values to. Uh, you could do that. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Did I pull up my other game? So this is a different game. I think I can full screen this one because it doesn't use pop-ups. Uh, I'm using a lot of uh, transitions here. That's a, a macro. Updated twine, now lets you fade out, which is not something I had when I was making this dang thing. Uh, I'm very excited about that. Um, this doesn't actually, I don't think, use a lot of the stuff that uh, we talked about in the workshop today, which isn't a good example then of stuff. But it is cool. It has random values and the amount of wood that you get. Which it's just that that random value is more often than not one. Um, so, uh, yeah. Oh my gosh, I completely forgot about a whole thing I was going to talk about. Let me stop here and go back and talk about that thing. I forgot about this thing. So, uh, basically, we talked about how Twine, by default, makes things black and white, right? Well, here's how you change that. Uh, there's this uh, link over here, edit story style sheet, right? This is a CSS code, which is a completely different coding thing from the rest of Twine. And in here, you get to change stuff, colors, yeah. So uh, essentially, there are several different parts of the Twine story, uh, and you can change any number of them at once, if you want them all to be the same color you could be. Uh, I have listed here, for example, uh, body, uh, twine story, twine passage, twine link, twine link hover, uh, enchantment link hover, twine link visited, twine link visited hover. Uh, if you did this line of code, you would set everything to black, so nothing would appear. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but I think it would show up if you uh, highlighted it. That's a cool thing you can do, hide some text. Uh, I'm actually, I actually do hide some text in my game, although just for formatting reasons and not to be all sneaky. Um, uh, this is just coding convention. Uh, this could all be on one line if you wanted it to be. You have to comment differently in CSS than in uh, Twine, which is silly. Uh, this is fully commented if you want to download this later. Essentially, uh, body and Twine sto story will uh, take uh, the, the change the most of Twine's like background and the text, unless you do Twine passage uh, down here, a different color. So this will, I think, take precedent on the text color. Uh, so this simply takes a CSS color picker value. Uh, so if we go to our color picker and we get like a nice magenta or something, um, we can make the horrendous choice of uh, making the background color that color. And 
if we play this, our eyes will burn. Ah, yes. So uh, do be mindful of the colors that you choose because they are not all good colors to use. Uh, personal preference, I do like a little darker colors and light text, but anything's fine. Um, so if we just take that, um, and that'll be a nice blue. This font family thing lets you change the font. By default, it looks like a Times New Roman or something like that. Uh, I don't know if this works. I want to say if I do like an Arial, that might change it. Um, bear in mind that not all machines have all fonts, so try to use the ones that are universal. Um, and yeah, that definitely is Arial. So uh, if you want to get away from the default twine black and white Times New Roman, check this out because it's a small touch, but it adds a lot to the, uh, to the experience. Now, if you wanted to guarantee that they had a cool font that wasn't innately there, uh, you could take this code right here. And uh, so what this does is it goes to Google Fonts, and it imports a very specific Google font. Uh, and then uh, following the formatting suggestions from Google Fonts, uh, you put in this information. Uh, you choose how big it is, and this should, I still have, uh, I should probably comment out this code, huh? Or just take you out, and we're good to go. I think this won't break it. So this is a different font entirely that still looks vaguely like Times New Roman, because I have really terrible taste in fonts. Um, but yeah, so I think as long as you have an internet connection, that should work. I don't know for sure. Um, but well, that's a really cool thing you can do. Uh, and again, it's a small step, but it makes your games look a lot better than just the defaults. Uh, think of it like uh, if you're in Unity, uh, switching out the UI buttons uh, really changes the look and feel of the game. Uh, passage, this will change the font color. So if we wanted to make the terrible choice of a icky green, um, we could do that. And then, uh, so over here, there's a lot of twine link things that you see here. This is a paranoid, inefficient way to do it. Essentially, um, links in twine have several different things that work with them. So twine link will be the color they appear by default. And then if you visit the page that they're already from, there'll be a different color. If you hover over it, it'll be a different, a different color altogether. So if you want them all to be the same color, to hide the fact that they've been to a page before, because why do they need that information, um, you can just set all these things to the same thing. Um, I would suggest still keeping it distinct from the other text, just for readability purposes. Um, but uh, if we look into our Twine game, for example, oh look, our text is green, but our links are still blue, and we hover over it, and it's brighter blue. Gross. And I've already been here, so this is purple now? It's weird. So if you want more consistency, uh, just change it in there. Yeah, no, uh, choose better colors than what I just did, please. Um, yeah, so change those colors there. Uh, they doesn't matter which ones you put in what order or how many are on a line, as long as they have the same properties happening to them. Uh, so I could have really put all these different link properties on the same line and put them all the same color at once. Um, and yeah. Any questions about the CSS style sheet and changing the colors of your Twine game? OK, cool. So that was a lot of stuff. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, there's a lot more to Twine as well that I didn't cover today, obviously. Um, well, you can just scroll down this. There's a lot of stuff that you can use at your disposal. Um, what I liked to do was go through here, read the ones that sounded interesting, uh, and that helped me a lot. Um, this has some good explanations for how to use things, when to use things, uh, uh, what they do. Um, if you need any more help, you're welcome to ask us in Discord. And uh, yeah, uh, some other things you can do include saving and loading games, uh, going to outside URLs. Images and audio are things that Twine can technically do, but it takes a lot of finagling. So I haven't personally tried to do uh, too much in terms of images and audio. 
Yes. I had two games where I put images in. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. um, you have to like link them to something on the internet. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason, a lot of my links broke. Mm -hmm. So images in Twine are finicky and horrid. Yes. No, I should have. There, there are ways I think to like have external like website hosted images and audio that help, but you still need like to do audio. Like forums suggest like downloading a third party program or a, an add on to Twine that you need to like import and use and have some weird stuff go on. It's messy, but possible if you're really interested. I think it helps to know a bit of JavaScript. Um, you, you may have noticed that Twine also has a JavaScript section. I don't know JavaScript, so I've never tried this, but any JavaScript under tier will immediately run when your story is open in a web browser. I have no idea what that means or what it does, uh, but maybe someone would. Um, what else? technically use Twine to play one of Brian games? That is an excellent question, and we should look into this sometime. Because it runs JavaScript automatically, so if you just control copy all of your game and pasted it in that thing, it would automatically run that. But why? So that you could run a Twine game after your game. So and like when you win the game, it sends you to a Twine game. You just copy paste it, and then the Twine is literally just a survey on his game. Yeah, good. <laughs> Oh, uh, something I did want to talk about. So um, you may be wondering, like, why all this? Why it's fine? Why are we learning how to program in a writing workshop? That's an excellent question, because you probably don't need to do all this. Um, the reason we use Twine, though, is because it is a good medium to do primarily writing while still taking into account game mechanics. Uh, the player can choose where to go when. There are links connecting the passages. They choose to move on. Using prompts, they choose to input text. Uh, you can basically have a conversation in Twine. Uh, it's a great practice tool for dialogue, storytelling, uh, game mechanics, and narrative. So that's why. And it's highly recommended by a lot of people in the industry to practice with Twine. Uh, it goes into portfolio. It does. Uh, you don't have to go so far into the mechanics, uh, especially as far as I've gone. I've done some dumb stuff that if you're curious about, I can show you later. Uh, <laughs> You don't need to make super fancy mechanics for your Twine games. All you need is um, going from one passage to another. And uh, that's all you would need to tell a good story. But at the same time, again, it's good practice taking, to uh, taking into account uh, game mechanics and narrative together. Because we are in video games. We can't take one away from the other. Uh, so that's why, uh, that's why Twine is good. That's why Twine is good practice. And that's why. It's unnecessary, but it's also fun to have stupid game mechanics in your Twine game. Through the use of arrays, data maps, variables, prompts, ch color changing text, uh, refreshing pages, and so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, if not, we're getting to the end here. All right, well, thank you all for coming to this workshop on Twine. I'm going to reemphasize once again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, all these Twine games, except for the ones that you can't download, are available to view. Uh, I'll link uh, the Sample Twine conversation and um, Twine Workshop 2. Uh, these are the more tutorial-based ones. They both have a lot of comments in their code, uh, so those can potentially help. Um, and yeah, uh, there's always a lot of great resources. I've, I mentioned this briefly, but uh, Twine's open source. There are forums for basically all the problems you could possibly have. Uh, so if you can't find it in the manual, if you can't find it uh, online, or if you can't, if we don't know the answer, there's probably a forum for it online, which is a redundancy. But yes. Uh, so with that, thank you all for coming, and uh, have a great day. And if you make any Twine games, show them off. I want to see them. <laughs> Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you and goodbye.